hyperkalemia. And of course, hyperkalemia is increased potassium in the blood. And the normal value for potassium is about 3.5 to 5.0 milli equivalents per liter. So you're looking at a potassium of greater than that, obviously. Most of the time, you don't worry until it's above 5.5. In terms of the cause, you're looking at three possible scenarios. The first one, which is the most common scenario of why someone gets hyperkalemia, is because of something called shift of potassium out of the cells into the blood. So a perfect example of this is what happens with red blood cells. So this is a blood vessel and inside you've got these red blood cells, RBCs. Now sometimes what happens is these red blood cells, hemolysis can occur. And when that happens, the potassium comes out of the cells into the bloodstream. So you have all this excess potassium because of the hemolysis of red blood cells and that results in an increased uh, potassium value when you measure it in the serum. Now, that's the most common reason. There's two other reasons why people can get hyperkalemia. The next one is when there's a problem with the kidney. Decreased excretion of potassium by the kidney. And that, of course, can happen when you have chronic kidney disease. And then the last reason is excessive intake of potassium, most commonly in the hospital setting. So what are the symptoms when someone uh, has hyperkalemia? How would they present? Most of the time, there is no symptoms. It's just detected on a routine lab test. But if there are symptoms, the symptoms are as follows. person can have weakness, fatigue. The muscle symptoms are actually pretty uh, specific. Muscle paralysis. Um, person can also have paresthesias sensation problems and then other cardiac related symptomatology such as palpitations diagnosis well of course measuring the serum potassium that's pretty obvious usually it's done on a routine exam uh, when somebody is checking the BMP basic metabolic profile the next test of course is to test the kidney how is the kidney doing? Because that's one of the big reasons someone can have hyperkalemia. So check their BUN and creatinine. The next test is a very important one. It's an EKG. Because when you do an EKG, you've got some very specific things that can happen with hyperkalemia. And of course, this is what I'm drawing is the PQRS T. Now, normally the T wave is not that large, but I made it large because that's what happens in hyperkalemia. It's, this is the way I remember it is that the potassium is filling that T wave. So one of the characteristic findings in hyperkalemia on an EKG is peaked T waves. So remember that. One other part of the diagnosis I definitely need to mention, in addition to these tests, is you need to review the patient's medications. Why? Because certain medications can also raise the person's potassium. And one of the most common is potassium sparing diuretics. Certain drugs like spironolactone, amelioride, uh, triamterene, those uh, diuretics can make a person's potassium level rise. So, how do you treat it? In mild cases of hyperkalemia where the potassium is not too high, between 5 and let's say 6, really just look at the medication that's causing the problem and stop that. If it's not a medication problem, you can give something known as sodium polystyrene. Now what this is, is a resin. And what that means is that it actually binds to the potassium in the body and then removes it from the GI tract. Now, the reason this is used essentially just in mild cases is because it's a slow acting it takes a while several hours three three hours or longer so for mild cases it's okay but for severe cases that's when things get more tricky 
and you're looking at anything above 6 to 6.5. If uh, potassium is greater than 6.5, that's actually pretty serious. The very first thing you need to do is give something known as calcium gluconate. And the reason is because this protects the heart. It protects, in particular, the cardiac muscle from any toxic effects of that hyperkalemia. And what we're talking about is the myocardium. So that's the very first thing. And this, you know, within five to 10 minutes, uh, will uh, giving calcium gluconate will help the patient. The next thing you need to do is give insulin. Now, why insulin? What What is the reason to give insulin? Well, insulin helps to shift potassium from the extracellular space into the cells. And when you do that, you normalize the potassium in the bloodstream. Now, I'll give you a scenario. So let's say you have a patient who has a high potassium, right? And then you also measure their glucose and it's normal. And then you give them insulin to lower their potassium down to normal. But what happens is the insulin also drives into the cell glucose. So now this patient's glucose level goes from normal to low. So that's a problem, right? So to avoid that problem, in addition to giving insulin, you also give glucose so that you avoid this hypoglycemia that the that can happen when you give insulin. There's a few other things that can be given that can reduce someone's potassium level in their bloodstream. A beta agonist, believe it or not, such as albuterol, can lower uh, uh, potassium levels. And also sometimes sodium uh, bicarb can also shift potassium uh, back into the cells. And in most extreme scenarios when the kidney is completely failed, you would have to give the patient dialysis. So let's take a look at a few vignettes. 60 year old man with diabetes, hypertension, lipidemia, and chronic renal insufficiency is admitted to the hospital because of lightheadedness. His meds include insulin, amlodipine, simvastatin. He is allergic to penicillin, which he gets, to which he gets an angioedema. Temperature 98, blood pressure is 98, Pulse is 87, respiratory rate 22. On exam, he is ill appearing. Cardiac rhythm is regular. Breath sounds are clear. Abdomen is benign. Chest x-ray shows clear lungs. EKG shows sinus rhythm with peaked T waves. Lab studies show a serum of serum sodium of 134, glucose at 98, potassium of 6.2. Most appropriate intervention at this time is. Well, because of his potassium value and his EKG, I put him in the moderate category. So you have to get a bit aggressive here. And the very first thing you want to do um, that's listed actually among these choices is give him insulin so that you can drive the potassium back into the cells. And you need to give glucose in addition because if you just gave him insulin, he would go into hypoglycemia. So you give him insulin as well to prevent him from going into hypoglycemia. And the final one, 48-year-old patient presents to the emergency department with tiredness, vomiting, and abdominal pain. It's a long history of hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. Um, and during this uh, past year, he developed end-stage renal disease. He admits to being depressed of late and has not kept his appointment with the nephrologist for dialysis, which he used to go three times a week. Patient is on medications for hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, in addition to meds for renal failure. Which of the following is the initial medication that should be administered to reverse the clinical condition reflected by the accompanying electrocardiogram pattern. Well, the clinical condition is hyperkalemia. How do I know that? Well, he missed his dialysis appointment, so his kidneys are not excreting the uh, potassium. And look at this EKG. You'll see some very tall T waves, right? And peak T waves are definitely a sign of hyperkalemia very first thing you need to do is protect the myocardium and that can be done with calcium gluconate so that's choice C the very next thing you would do is give insulin to drive the potassium back into the cells